Welcome to Introduction to Clinical Management of Exposure to Arena Viruses. My name is Vanessa Raba, and I will be giving the presentation today. So here are the mandatory disclosures associated with this recording. This recording is funded by a grant from ASPR. The content of this presentation is a product of the individual presenters. It does not represent the official policy of the US government, and it is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Um, also, just so that you know, we will be discussing the off-label use of products and the use of investigational products in this recording. Conflicts of interest. Um, I have no relevant financial interest or relationships to disclose. However, I do currently work for Pfizer. The materials that are presented in this recording are only my personal work and views and do not reflect those of my employer. Um, and in the course of this recording, we are not going to be discussing any activities or products associated or manufactured by Pfizer. So let's start off with an overview of arena viruses. Arena viruses are a family of enveloped negative sense RNA viruses. They're single stranded and they use ambisense encoding, which means you have genes encoded going both ways on the genome. And if you read anything about arena viruses, you'll see them referred to both as arena viruses and mammarina viruses, which are actually a genus within arena viruses. All the human pathogens belong to the mammarina virus genus, which means they are arena viruses that affect mammals. There are 48 named mammarina viruses that we know of as of 2022. And out of these, 13 are what we're worried about, which can cause human disease. All of these viruses are named as arena viruses because of the sandy appearance that they have an electron microscopy that you can see on the right with these um, dark black dots, which are electrodense. And these are actually host ribosomes that are taken up into the envelope of the virus as the virus is budding off from the cell. Out of those 13 arena viruses that we're worried about that cause human disease, these are further subdivided into two different complexes. There's the loss of lymphocytic or choreomeningitis complex, as well as the Takariba virus complex. And these are also referred to sometimes as old world arena viruses and new world arena viruses. There are four old world arena viruses that cause human disease, but the only two we're gonna talk about today are Lassa virus and Luho virus. Out of the new world arena viruses, there are five that we're gonna talk about today, which are Chapare, Guaranito, Yunin, Machupo, and Sabia viruses which are collectively known as the South American hemorrhagic fever viruses. The reason that we're going to talk about these seven today is as a group, these are all associated with human viral hemorrhagic fevers. We don't have time to go through these all individually, but in general, when people become infected with this, they have a nonspecific febrile illness at first. And as that illness worsens, they tend to have a lot of associated bleeding, hence the name hemorrhagic fever viruses. These tend to have a very high mortality and they require some special precautions. So we're gonna focus on these and not talk so much about the others. How do you get exposed to arena viruses? Well, all of the arena viruses and the, throughout the world are basically transmitted by exposure to rodents. So you can either have this directly, for example, if you're bitten by a rodent, or you can have indirect exposure to rodent urine or feces. This could be via ingestion, for example, if you were eating a contaminated food, or it could be via inhalation, if you were in a dusty environment where rodents are excreting a lot of urine or feces that then gets aerosolized or this could be by handling a rodent and having contamination on your hands that you then um, get further exposure to. In addition, you can also have human to human transmission occur. And this is particularly common in healthcare settings associated with exposure to infected fluids, as well as accidental lab exposure. And in animal models of these arena viruses, we do see that in a lab uh, setting, you can get aerosol transmission between different animals, although we have not necessarily observed that type of transmission from humans to humans, it is a potential concern. So if you're concerned about somebody who might be exposed to an arena virus, the first steps are really to identify, isolate, and inform. So starting with the first step to identify, you want to think about really has this person had a potential exposure to arena virus? How likely is this? Were they handling rodents? Were they involved with the care of somebody who had a very severe illness or had an illness that had a lot of bleeding that wasn't necessarily identified? And if so, what arena viruses are potentially involved? 
The next step is you'd like to isolate the patient. So all of these seven arena viruses that I mentioned earlier um, have special infectious precautions associated with them. So you wanna follow the CDC guidance for isolation and personal protective equipment for use of viral hemorrhagic fevers. Now these are essentially the same guidelines you would use for arena virus infections as you would use for somebody who had, for example, an Ebola virus infection. If you don't have experience with this in your center and you have a high risk exposure or confirmed infection, you'd wanna consider transferring this person to a biocontainment unit so that you have a team who's very experienced with donning and doffing all this personal protective equipment and taking these special precautions. The next thing you wanna do if you've identified somebody who has a high risk exposure or confirmed infection is inform. And this is starting with your local team. So infection control at whatever facility you're at so that they can help instigate all these precautions appropriately, as well as local public health authorities so they can review if this patient has an infection or if there's a potential high risk, they could help with facilitating access to diagnostic measures. When you think about patient care in these settings, there are a lot of different things that you have to do, and this is why I recommend that you refer to that CDC document for viral hemorrhagic fevers. Ideally, if you have somebody who has a high risk exposure or in a confirmed infection with an arena virus, you wanna put them in a single patient room, private bathroom facilities, and if you have a negative pressure room, you want to use that, again, because in animal studies, they have seen aerosol transmission between animals, especially if you're gonna be doing any type of aerosol generating procedures with the patient. You do wanna restrict access to that room to people who have been trained to use appropriate gear. And you especially wanna minimize exposure with um, sharps. So practice safe sharp and waste practices, as well as using all the appropriate personal protective equipment, which you can see here on the right in the example of this. Essentially you wanna cover the skin and mucus uh, membranes from head to toe. So this includes head and neck coverings, eye protection, a respirator or a papper, at a minimum, if you don't have these, if you're working in a limited setting, at least a face mask, but ideally, again, given the potential risk for aerosolization, um, you'd wanna use a respirator or a papper. You wanna use fluid resistant disposable gowns and coveralls, because if you're getting anything on, the, on these, you wanna be able to throw that out rather than washing it. A waterproof apron, um, because these patients could potentially be having bleeding, they could potentially be vomiting or having diarrhea. You wanna make sure all your gear is waterproof. You wanna do two pairs of gloves, ideally with extended cuffs to help minimize exposures that way, as well as covering your shoes with either waterproof boots or shoe covers. And the extent of infection control for these types of infections does not stop with the patient. So you also wanna be thinking about your lab and the personal protective gear your clinical lab might be using, because this is not something they're necessarily gonna be very familiar with. And as they are doing lab tests, they are potentially getting exposure to blood, potentially being exposed to aerosolized um, materials if they're doing activities like centrifuges. So you want to ensure that your clinical lab has appropriate gear, including eye protection, a mask or respirator, impermeable gown, and gloves. And ideally, you want any blood work to be done in a biosafety class 2 cabinet, which helps pull air away from the person who's performing the test into a HEPA filter. And any type of procedures that you're doing, you want to use secondary containers. This is important both if you're collecting blood or other specimens from the patient to ensure that these are stored in secondary containers before being transferred to the lab, but also as they're doing lab procedures like centrifugation, that secondary containers are used and that all the equipment is decontaminated after use. So now thinking about care for the patient, the mainstay for arena viruses is really supportive care. So you wanna be monitoring their vital signs, ensuring that they're maintaining appropriate volume status, their electrolytes are okay, that you're managing any acid-base abnormalities. And a lot of these arena viruses that we've talked about are found in other countries. So if you're having people who are returning from South America or from Africa that you're evaluating for these, you also wanna be thinking about potential other underlying conditions or co-infections. As I manage these start with non-specific febrile symptoms, so they can be very hard to identify based on clinical symptoms alone until very late in the clinical course. Um, so you want to ensure that you know, if somebody's coming in and you're thinking about an arena virus, you're not excluding other conditions that are more common, such as malaria that are treatable or could be co-infections.
You also want to be performing symptom-based management. And because these are really infectious conditions and have high fatality and you're putting somebody in kind of an isolation unit, really important part of this is providing appropriate mental and social support because this can be a very stigmatizing experience for the patient even just to have an exposure to be quarantined and away from their family and concerned about potentially developing one of these conditions. If you have patients who are bleeding or have low hemoglobins, you also want to consider transfusions if they're appropriate. And if you can do them safely, if you have patients who have evidence of end organ damage, you want to do supportive interventions um, for those organs, such as dialysis for renal failure, again, if you can do these safely at your facility. And if not, you want to think about transferring to biocontainment unit if the patient is stable enough. Getting into a little bit more specific options for treatment. In terms of uh, antivirals, we have two options. So ribavirin is the first one, which is a guanosine nucleoside analog. And this actually has an antiviral effect, but is also thought to have potential immune modulation effects and affect how the cells get damaged. Um, as with kind of all the things we're going to discuss today, none of them are licensed for the use of arenavirus infections. We unfortunately don't have any licensed treatments yet. So use of ribavirin is off-label, but it has been done to treat multiple arenaviruses that cause viral hemorrhagic fevers, including Lassa, Luho, LCMV, which we're not necessarily talking about, which causes a meningitis rather than a viral hemorrhagic fever. Unine virus Machupo and Sabia, which are some of the South American viral hemorrhagic fevers. Now, most studies that have used ribavirin, both in animals and in humans, have shown a decreased mortality with IV ribavirin treatment. However, there is some concern with loss of virus infection, which is probably the most well studied out of these viral hemorrhagic fevers, that there could be some populations that are not appropriate for ribavirin therapy. So there has been some studies that suggest a potential increased mortality in patients who are treated with ribavirin if they have normal LFT levels, so if they don't have evidence of liver damage. So in terms of loss of virus infection, the use of ribavirin can sometimes be a little bit controversial. But for other viruses, such as unine virus, which cause Argentine hemorrhagic fever, they, we do have good data that they reduce mortality, for example, in unine virus from 40% to 12.5%. Now, there are some caveats to the use of ribavirin, and that is that side effects are extremely common, and you can have a wide range of side effects. I've put some of the more common ones up here, such as changes in mood, dizziness, fatigue, fever, headache, nausea, and weakness, but you can also have um, more serious side effects, such as severe chills with infusion. And we do have two black box warnings on ribavirin. It's not to be used during pregnancy or in men whose female partners are pregnant due to a risk of birth defects, as well as a risk of developing severe hemolytic anemia. So the concern with a lot of these side effects, other than tolerability, is that if you have somebody who's already having these symptoms, it can be really hard to tell also what are symptoms that are associated with ribavirin and what are symptoms of disease progression. Another note with ribavirin is that for some of the South American hemorrhagic fevers, we can sometimes see this late neurological syndrome where people recover from their acute infection and then several weeks to months later develop neurological illness associated with that infection. And treatment with ribavirin in animal models has not been shown to block this. So you can still see this late syndrome even if you use ribavirin as an antiviral therapy. Now the other antiviral that we have in our toolkit is favipiravir, and this is an oral purine nucleoside analog, which is nice to have an oral option, but this is not licensed for use for any conditions in the US. It is licensed in some other countries, for example, in Japan for the treatment of influenza, but if you're going to give this to anybody in the United States, you have to get an EIND or emergency investigational new drug use for each particular patient to treat them, and that needs to be done in advance. Favipiravir has been shown in multiple animal models to have good antiviral activity against arenaviruses and improve survival. So if you look here on the right side, you can see in a macaque model with loss of virus in macaques that are infected with loss of virus and then treated five to 17 days post-infection. In figure A, macaques who received favipiravir had lower clinical scores compared to those that received placebo. In figure B, that they had 100% survival compared to 0% survival in placebo. And in figure C, that you 
essentially see very, very low levels of virus in the blood com with favipiravir compared to macaques that are treated with placebo. Now, another thing to note for favipiravir is like ribavirin, it is teratogenic and embryotoxic, so it is, it is contraindicated in any women who is breastfeeding. Now, you can also potentially combine both favipiravir and ribavirin therapy, and this has been done in a few human cases, really three total that have been published, two for loss of fever and one for unine virus infection. All of these survived, but with an N of three, it's hard to know how effective this is. If we look at animal models, we both see increased survival as well as a synergistic antiviral effect when you treat with both ribavirin and favipiravir compared to either alone. So if you look at the right, this is a hamster model of Pashinde virus, which is oftentimes used as a surrogate for the South American hemorrhagic fevers because it's safer to work with in the laboratory. And these hamsters were treated with either placebo, ribavirin alone, favipiravir alone, or the combination at different doses. And you can see A, B, C, and D are all survival curves of challenged hamsters who are then given one of these therapies. And you can see in A, C, and D, the combination treatment of favipiravir and ribavirin results in the best survival compared to either alone or placebo. So moving on to post-exposure prophylaxis, because when you have a patient who's coming in, you may not know at that time whether or not they actually have the arena virus infection, but you may be concerned about it. So ideally, you could think about starting one of these antivirals early, but this has been poorly studied and the effect of this is unknown. For loss of virus, there are some guidelines out there recommending the use of oral ribavirin. Um, there's one that has a specific dosing regimen, but if you look through the literature, there have been other dosing regimens that have been used. We don't know the optimal dosing or the effectiveness of any of these regimens. For favipiravir, it has not been used for post-exposure prophylaxis for arenavirus infections that have been described in the literature to date. However, it has been used for other viral hemorrhagic fevers such as Ebola virus infection, and you can see the regimen that was used for Ebola virus infection below. Again, we don't know how well this works. Whether or not you want to consider starting post-exposure prophylaxis is going to depend on a number of factors, including your patient's medical conditions, what arena virus you think they may have been exposed to, how likely you think that is that the exposure occurred. Was it low risk? Was it medium risk? Was it high risk? Is it just theoretical? Um, as well as the tolerability and underlying medical conditions of those individuals. So this is a complicated decision that you should discuss with your patients if you have somebody who you think potentially has an exposure and you're interested in using antiviral prophylaxis. And we have a few investigational products that are arenavirus specific that I'm going to mention because these are, we have either data in humans or non-human primates for these. The first one is for loss of virus. Um, so again, this is an investigational project. It is not licensed and will require an emergency IND for use in the US. But this is a product where we have good data in non-human primates uh, that it could potentially confer increased survival. So this is a product called Aravirumab 3. It's a combination of three broadly neutralizing antibodies against loss of virus infection. And in non-human primates, this has conferred 100% survival for loss of virus infection, even when started seven to eight days after infection. And there are a few studies now that have looked at different strains of loss of virus and so far seeing benefit in all the strains that it has been tested against. So you can, what you can see on the bottom is a graph from one of these studies where Arifiramab 3 is started at day seven or eight, and given at three different time points, which you can see there's a blue regimen, there's a gold regimen, and there's this black downward facing triagonal regimen. And all of those had 100% survival for Aravirumab 3 compared to the control group where you had 100% mortality. So the other arena virus that we have some specific countermeasures against is unine virus. So if you have somebody who's going to be at high risk of exposure to unina virus, there actually is a vaccine available called Candid Number 1 vaccine. 
The caveat to this is, is that it's only licensed and available in Argentina, and it is a live attenuated vaccine. It's a single dose that's only available from the Argentinian government. So if you have somebody who's going to be doing high risk work in that country, you can have them potentially investigate getting the vaccine product ahead of time. This does seem to be pretty effective, 95 to 98% against presenting Argentinian hemorrhagic fever and 84% protective against any symptomatic unine virus infection. And one of the things to think about if you're having a participant where you're worried about unine virus infection is to really ask if, the, if they've come from Argentina, have they had this vaccine before? Because this might modify the expected disease course that you're going to see. It might still be symptomatic, but maybe milder. However, those are patients who you still need to use all the appropriate protective gear to prevent against secondary transmission. And if you're not thinking about asking about this, you may not think about this in somebody who's having a milder infection if they've had a previous vaccine. There's also another potential treatment for unine virus infection, which is convalescent serum. This is from humans who have had previous infection. And this has been shown in several studies to reduce mortality if it's given in the first eight days after you need virus infection. This is oftentimes a time where you're still having nonspecific symptoms. So a time that you, it's effective is really a time you have to be proactive in thinking and asking about risk factors for infection. And the studies that are out there, convalescent serum during this time frame has brought mortality down to really the low single digits, so very significant effect compared to 16 to 40 percent mortality. The caveat to this is it may be difficult to obtain, especially if you're outside of Argentina, and patients who are treated with this could still develop late neurological syndrome. So giving this antibody therapy does not block that potential, and it's something that you would need to counsel patients could develop even after convalescence. The last thing I wanted to mention about arena virus exposure is that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, these infections tend to be relatively rare, and because of the infectivity, they're very difficult to study because they require specialized laboratories. But one of the big questions that has come up in the last few years is the potential for sexual transmission of arena viruses. And this is data that's coming out really for loss of virus infections. Um, Given everything we've seen with Ebola virus and understanding the possibility for sexual transmission there, people have started looking at this and have actually found loss of virus to be very common in the semen of men who have loss of infection and are sick enough to be hospitalized, even up to a year after their discharge. So you can see in the top graph on the right, this is PCR results of seminal fluid from loss of survivors. And at the time of discharge from the hospital, 80% were PCR positive in their seminal fluid, and that dropped down to 2% at one year. But you can see it can be quite prolonged shedding by PCR. Now, PCR does not always translate over to infectious virus because it's just de detecting the genetic material. So they did take a subset of these patients, which you can see on the bottom of the screen, and test to see whether or not they could isolate infectious and virus either in cell culture or by inoculation into mice. And out of the subset that they tested, overall 52% of these were positive for infectious virus. You can see that this, this persisted up until nine months after discharge from the hospital. And so with loss of virus, this really may, remains a question. What, does this actually happen for human to human transmission? We don't know. But I think given that there's this question out there, it's important to counsel male survivors and their partners appropriately on the potential risk for this. Um, and we really need future studies to understand what the actual risk is, how long that risk persists, and how these viruses may be shed in women, um, as well as if this potential risk also exists for other arena viruses aside from loss of virus. So in summary, if you have a patient who you think may be potentially exposed to an arena virus, your first steps are to identify, isolate, and inform um, so that you can figure out what is going on with this potential exposure, what diseases am I worried about, ensure that you're instigating appropriate infectious precautions, and alerting appropriate authorities both at your local facility as well as with the public health department. You wanna start with providing supportive care, which is really the mainstay for treatment for any arena virus infections. And if you have somebody who you think has a high risk exposure and 
post-exposure prophylaxis may be appropriate, you can consider that after doing appropriate counseling and risk assessment. If you have somebody who is diagnosed with one of these arenaviruses, you can consider off-label or investigational use of antivirals, which are options are ribavirin and favipiravir, and or antibody products. Again, knowing that all the antibody products that I've mentioned today are not licensed in the US as well as favipiravir, so the use of any of these is going to require an EIND prior to giving it to your patient. Additionally, you want to counsel your patients appropriately on the potential risks of transmission, including potential for sexual transmission that could persist even after they recover from their infection. So thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this presentation.